Okay, so we are going to talk about the neuron. And as you see, I labeled this just in case for some reason you couldn't tell what my beautiful Picasso drawing of the neuron was. So these are going to represent the dendrite. This is the cell body, and our little circle here is just the nucleus. In the cell body, this is where all the organelles are located. So Golgi apparatus, endoplasmic reticulum, all of that. And then we have the axon hillock that sits next to the cell body, along with the axon. At the end here, this is all referred to as the telodendria, and part of the telodendria are the terminal glutons. And then we know that this is neuron number one, so this is our presynaptic neuron. And then this is neuron number two, so this is our postsynaptic neuron, okay? So we're going to start talking about how neurons communicate, okay? And we're going to start with what's referred to as resting membrane potential. So this is an essay on exam number two. This is definitely an essay, not a maybe. And there are five parts to this essay. Resting membrane potential, graded potential, action potential, propagation, and secretion. And this essay is worth 50 points on exam number two. All right? Let me close this door real quick. Okay, so now you know what the parts are. I'm just going to erase these so that I have some room to write. fluid. Okay? So everything that is part of the whiteboard that's all the way around this neuron, because one of the hard things is when you're drawing it on a board, it's hard to remember this is 3D. Okay? So all the way around this neuron on the outside is our extracellular fluid like my beaker of water. And one of the things I'm going to add to this extracellular fluid is I'm going to add a whole bunch of sodium ions. So that we have, in the extracellular fluid, a very high concentration of sodium ions. Lots and lots of sodium ions floating around outside of my neuron. Now, if I look on the inside of the neuron in the intracellular fluid, I'm also going to find that there is some sodium inside my neuron, but not as much. It's a much lower concentration of sodium in the intracellular fluid compared to the extracellular fluid. Very low concentration of potassium in the extracellular fluid, but 
If we look in the intracellular fluid, lots of potassium. Very high concentration of potassium ions in the intracellular fluid. concentration in the extracellular fluid, low concentration in the intracellular fluid, and the opposite is of potassium. Low concentration in the extracellular fluid, high concentration in the intracellular fluid. Now, throughout this neuron, there are leak gates. These are integral protein gates that are always open. They never close. And they allow sodium and potassium to diffuse through these gates. And they are throughout the entire neuron's membrane. What are they called? Leak gates.
there are three binding sites for sodium, and there are two binding sites for potassium. And then also located on this pump is the ATPase enzyme. Okay, now watch. Sodium is diffusing in. Simple diffusion in. But we want to have a high concentration always on the outside. So when that sodium diffuses in, we're going to actively transport through our pump three sodium ions out. Okay? So we're going to have three sodium ions bind in this pump, and they're coming from inside the cell to the pump. And then you remember, we're going to take ATP and break it down into ADP plus a phosphate, and we're going to use this phosphate to cause the pump to actively transport these three sodium ions out of our cell into the extracellular fluid so we maintain that high sodium concentration in the extracellular fluid. Once those three sodium are pumped out of the cell, we're going to have two potassium that are going to be actively transported back into the cell so we can maintain high concentration of potassium in the intracellular fluid. So two potassium ions are going to move from the extracellular fluid, use the same phosphate, and transport those two back into the cell. transport three sodium out. Potassium diffuses out and then we actively transport two potassium back into the neuron. This way we keep a high concentration of sodium in the extracellular fluid, a high concentration of potassium in the intracellular fluid. Any questions so far? So we don't reach equilibrium. Now notice we're actively transporting three sodium out for every two potassium in to the cell. Which means that we're actively transporting more positive charges outside in comparison to the positive charges inside. We don't have as many. Can you say that again? Which part? The, the three sodium are actively transported out, two potassium actively transported in. So we now are going to have more positive charges on the outside of our cell compared to the inside. And so we could write it like this. We could say in the extracellular fluid, we have more positive charges compared to the intracellular fluid, not as many positive charges. 
Now, I'm just writing it in that one little place, but we could do that across the entire neuron's membrane. More positive charges outside, not as many positive charges inside. Any questions about that? Wait, why was it um, negative in the inside? Because you don't have as many positive charges in there, so the negative ions take over. So even though there's more potassium inside, that's still not as much? Three to two. I'm pumping out more positive charges than I'm pumping in. Okay. Now, any time there's a difference in the amount of charges inside versus outside the membrane, we say there is a polarity to the membrane. So a polarity means there's a difference in charges across the membrane. Difference in charges inside versus outside of our membrane. Would neurons be the only no. cells that have that? No. As a matter of fact, everything I'm telling you right now in resting membrane potential pertains to every single cell in the body. Every cell in the body has a difference in polarity. And usually because of sodium and potassium. Okay, so polarity again means we have a difference in the amount of charges across our membrane, inside versus outside. More positive charges outside, less positive charges inside. Now, we have a lot of ions moving across the membrane. Sodium and potassium are diffusing in and out, and then sodium and potassium are being actively transported in and out. And any time ions move, they create energy. They actually create an energy that's usable, a kinetic energy. So anytime these ions are flowing across our membrane, in and out of the membrane, like we've been seeing, they can create a kinetic energy. This is how your battery works in your vehicle. It creates a kinetic energy because of ions. So if you look at your car battery, okay, and most people don't know much about the car battery, but it's the same thing as a neuron. So let's say this is your car battery. And you know you have those little post things sticking out of your battery. You might have seen those, right? And one of them's red and one of them's black. One's positive, one's negative. Yeah, they call them terminals, exactly. If you look inside your battery, though, these posts lead into a region that's hollow. So there's a really large compartment in your battery that is hollow. And what they do is they pour into this a mixture of H2SO4 plus water. This is sulfuric acid and water. And when you do that, you find that the hydrogen ions and the sulfate ions will separate in the water. Now those ions are positively and negatively charged, so they are going to be attracted to the opposite post and those ions will begin to flow. The hydrogen ions towards the negative, the sulfate ions towards the positive. And usually when you turn your key, push your button, whatever it is, it zaps a little electricity in there that helps those ions to float faster. And they start moving very quickly towards those posts and that creates a kinetic energy that eventually, as it moves, actually causes your spark plug to spark and the reason your spark plug sparks is so that it can create a little explosion because something called your carburetor releases a little bit of gas and when the spark plug sparks and the gas is released you get a tiny explosion that moves your pistons up and down and then your tire, uh, anyway, my father was a mechanic, can you tell me? Uh, I learned how to strip down a 1967 Mustang when I was 12 years old and rebuilt the engine. Okay, so uh, this is the same way your neurons work. Your neurons are causing a flow of ions. Now when these ions flow, we can measure the amount of energy that they produce. And that amount of energy uh, for your battery is what we would call 12 volts. You have a 12 volt battery in your car. Now. When scientists were first starting to learn about neurons, it was very interesting, uh, they began to study neurons by studying squid. Now, squid 
are without a doubt the dumbest animal on the face of the planet. Because squid, for their entire central and peripheral nervous system, have exactly one neuron. That's all they have. And so depending on the size of the squid, their neuron is usually just about as big as a squid. So you can take a squid about this big and strip their neuron out, and you're going to have one big honking neuron, which makes it really nice to work with and do experiments on. And so one of the things that these scientists, as they're experimenting on these squid neurons, did is they took something called a voltmeter. And it's the same thing they use on your battery. If you think your battery is going bad, they take a voltmeter and they test whether your battery has 12 volts in it or not. Now, coming off of this voltmeter, there's two wires. And in this case, coming off of the wires are these little glass things, kind of sort of look like little pipettes. And you can take these and push them through the cell membrane to the inside of the cell. And then the second one you put on the outside of the cell membrane and let them sit. And the ions will start flowing through this and they will allow the voltmeter to pick up the charge. And when somebody measured the energy or the charge of the flowing ions coming in and out, not, not flowing down, all our ions are moving in and out of the cell membrane. They were able to read this charge, not very much. It was 70 millivolts. Now I put a little negative there. That negative represents the fact that it's negative inside. It's not really the voltage. So at rest, the voltage that's produced, the kinetic energy that's produced by our neuron is 70 millivolts, or because it's negative inside, they call it minus 70 millivolts, which is also our resting membrane potential. And that's the end of the first section of your neuron essay. We're done with resting membrane potential. Any questions so far? Okay, so when you're talking about resting membrane potential in your essay, you're going to start off the same way I did. You're not going to give me the anatomy of a neuron. Don't tell me the different parts about it. I don't want a drawing. Don't worry about it. Just start off telling me that sodium is in the highest concentration in the extracellular fluid and in a lower concentration in the intracellular fluid. And then talk about potassium being in a higher concentration in the intracellular fluid, lower concentration in the extracellular fluid. Then move on to the leak gates, which are found throughout the entire cell membrane. They're always open and they let sodium diffuse into the neuron while potassium diffuses out of the neuron. And this could lead to equilibrium, but we don't want that to happen. And I can tell you why now, because if sodium potassium came to equilibrium, would we be able to have a voltage? No, no. no because ions wouldn't be moving anymore. And we'll, sh we'll talk more about voltage in a little bit, but we have to maintain a voltage. So sodium is diffusing in, potassium is diffusing out. We don't want equilibrium, so we're going to use the sodium-potassium ATPase pumps, which are also found throughout the entire cell membrane. They're always working. They never turn off. And so we're going to actively transport three sodium out for two potassium in to our neuron. This creates a polarity. There will be more positive charges on the outside of the membrane, less positive charges on the inside of the membrane. And because of all these ions moving back and forth across the membrane, it creates a kinetic energy that we measure at rest in our neuron, minus 70 millivolts. You do not have to explain how the sodium potassium pump works. You do not have to explain how a voltmeter works. So you said the ions moving in and out creates kinetic energy? Correct. 
Any other questions? Yeah. Is there a home use that I like um, mm -hmm. really voltage is supposed to be outside of the mm -hmm. cells? Mm -hmm. Like minus seventy sense. millivolts is the normal voltage for a neuron. On the inside. No, this is the voltage across the membrane. Because remember, voltage is movement of ions. It's a kinetic energy. It's a movement of ions. So it's the ions moving in and out of the membrane. So it's minus 70 millivolts. And we only put the minus there because it's negative on the inside. Any other questions? Susceptor, we're going to create pain. Now, in order to perceive this pain, we have a specialized gate, a specialized integral protein that is only found on the dendrites and the cell body. No place else. This gate is only on the dendrites and the cell body. gate is referred to as a ligand regulated gate. What's only on the dendrites in the cell body? The ligand regulated gate. Again, 
We have ligand regulated gates that are only on the dendrites and the cell body. And our cells that are feeling pain are going to release enkephalin. And enkephalin will bind to these ligand regulated gates to cause them to open. When they open, the only thing that is able to move through the gate is sodium. Sodium can then diffuse through this ligand regulated gate into our neuron. Here, what kind of intensity is my brain going to perceive? Intense. 
Uh, yeah. Instead of my brain perceiving somebody barely stepped on my toe, my brain is going to perceive I had a bowling ball on my toe. Okay? That is not a good thing. You want your brain to perceive exactly how much pain you're really feeling and not more or even less than what you're perceiving. So we're going to talk about the fact how it happens, but however many gates open on the first neuron has to be the same number of gates in every single neuron in this pathway to the brain so that the brain perceives the right intensity of response. Uh, some people have problems with pain receptors. And a lot of times they will feel excessive amounts of pain because of the fact that there's some miscommunication between the pre- and postsynaptic neuron. And no one exactly understands how that happens, but it's just like we're saying, they might have been zero receptors that should be open, but in the next neuron they're saying there's 50,000. And the next neuron is stimulating itself without even the first one telling it to be stimulated. So they feel much more pain uh, than they should, than they need to. Uh, it, when the open makes sense of pain, right, but uh, what's the purpose of all the sodium coming in? Do it uh, into the cell? I'll tell you in just a second. We haven't gotten there yet. Huh? Well, it's Basically, it. yes. Any other questions before we move on? Okay, so we have these ligand regulated gates that have opened because of enkephalin. And our sodium is diffusing in. Now, we already have a very high concentration of potassium inside this cell. And as the sodium diffuses in, okay, so we have this potassium that's just sitting inside the cell, and we have this kind of wave of sodium that's starting to diffuse in. What will happen when the sodium meets up with the potassium? They'll repel. They'll repel because they're both positively charged. So as this sodium is diffusing in through our ligand regulated gate, it's going to meet up with the potassium and repel it. And so what you're going to see is you're going to see a lot of this potassium that's inside moving along the membrane, being repelled by our sodium that's diffusing in. And the potassium is going to start accumulating right around the axon hillock. Now, some of the potassium may go a little bit further, but most of it is going to stay right here. Just because when the sodium comes in and repels that potassium, it doesn't do it with very much force. It only goes a short distance down the membrane. It can't go very far. And so we get, again, most of this potassium that has repelled accumulating right at our axon hillock. So these specialized gates 
are what are referred to as voltage regulated gates. These gates are able to open and close when there are changes in voltage. And I said only down the axon and I should have said all the way to the terminal boutons. Sorry about that. So these voltage regulated gates are found down the axon to the terminal boutons. from the axon to our terminal boutons. And again, they're going to open and close due to changes in voltage. So if I could take my voltmeter and I could measure the changes that are occurring as our potassium starts to build up here. So with our greater response, sodium is repelling potassium to this axon milli. And if I could measure the changes in voltage as the potassium begins to accumulate, what I would see is that the voltage would go from minus 70 millivolts, our resting membrane potential, and begin to climb to around minus 50 millivolts. And this is simply because of our potassium accumulation. to the axon hillock, the potassium is accumulating and the voltage is beginning to rise from minus 70 millivolts to minus 50 millivolts. Minus 50 millivolts is the trigger voltage or the threshold voltage. It's the voltage we need to get to to start our action potential. By the way, I'm sorry, I forgot to remind you, this is probably a good place to be on a fresh, clean piece of paper with action potential written at the top of it. If you're going to be taking your notes, make it separate from graded potential. At least draw lines across so that in your mind, when you're studying it, you can study it separately. Because I get a lot of students, when they write their essays, they put together information from graded potential and action potential. They get them mixed up. They kind of weave them together. You don't want to do that. That's a good way to miss points. Okay, so our accumulation of potassium here at the axon hillock is causing our voltage to change from minus 70 to minus 50 millivolts, which is our trigger voltage to start our action potential. And at the beginning of this action potential, the first thing that happens is right in this area, right here in the axon hillock, we have a whole bunch of these voltage regulated gates. And a few of them, not a lot, a few of them are going to open. Now these voltage regulated gates, when they open, they are, like the ligand regulated gates, only going to allow sodium to diffuse in. So at minus 50 millivolts, some of our voltage regulated gates are going to open. You said the accumulation, there was a large number of them at the axon hillock? Yes. Thank you. Negative 50, is that higher, higher voltage or less? Okay, so one more time, we have this accumulation of potassium that's occurring and it's changing our voltage from minus 70 to minus 50 mil millivolts, our trigger voltage, that causes some of the voltage regulated gates here at the axon hillock to open and sodium begins to diffuse in to our neuron. 
Now notice you've got more positive charges right here at the axon hillock as the sodium diffuses in, which now also means that our voltage is going to rise even more. So maybe we go from minus 50 to minus 30 millivolts due to the sodium diffusing in. This change or this rise in voltage from our sodium diffusing in will actually cause more of our voltage regulated gates to open. And now more sodium will diffuse in. Now every time sodium diffuses in, sodium will cause the voltage to rise. And so our voltage, let's say, will go from minus 30 to, let's say, 0 millivolts. And every time the voltage rises, we're going to have the same thing occur. More sodium voltage regulated gates will open and more sodium will diffuse in. And the sodium diffusing in will again cause our voltage to rise. And maybe this time we're at plus 20 millivolts. So we have a rise in voltage causes our sodium voltage regulated gates to open. So our potassium causes the voltage to go up. We hit minus 50 and the sodium voltage regulated gates will open. Sodium diffuses in. The sodium causes the voltage to rise again. And more sodium voltage regulated gates open and sodium diffuses in and that sodium diffusing in causes the voltage to rise again. And when the voltage rises, more sodium voltage regulated gates open and more sodium diffuses in and the sodium diffusing in increases the voltage which causes more voltage regulated gates to rise and more, or to open, excuse me, and more sodium diffuses in and that sodium diffusing in causes the voltage to rise. You see a pattern here? This is a positive feedback. And one of the things that I told you when we talked first about positive feedback is there has to be a shutoff switch. You have to be able to stop it. And eventually, our voltage is going to rise to plus 30 millivolts. At plus 30 millivolts, two things are going to occur. Number one, all our sodium voltage regulated gates close. So right in here, where all these gates just opened, they all snap shut. That's their maximum. That's the shutoff switch, plus 30 millivolts. They're all going to close. So all the sodium voltage regulated gates snap shut. They all close. At the same time that the sodium voltage regulated gates close, there also happens to be in the same area, I lost my book. Oh, that in this same area, there are also potassium voltage regulated gates. And they're all going to open at once at plus 30 millivolts. Which means that all this potassium that we accumulated here during the graded potential is going to diffuse out because all these voltage regulated gates just opened. And we're going to have all this potassium diffusing out of our neuron. Which also means that our voltage is going to drop. So, let's go back just a little bit. From minus 50 millivolts to plus 30 millivolts, this was a positive feedback.
having an accumulation of potassium occurring right around the axon hillock. As more and more potassium begins to accumulate, the voltage is changing from minus 70 and going up to minus 50, which is our trigger voltage. What this triggers is some of our sodium voltage regulated gates to open. So some of these gates right here are going to open and some sodium is going to diffuse in. The diffusing in of sodium causes the voltage to rise. It's the sodium entering the cell that causes the voltage to rise. Because the voltage rises, we get more of these voltage regulated gates opening. And more sodium diffuses in. What's going to happen when more sodium diffuses in? The voltage is going to rise again. And so we get an increase in voltage again. And any time the voltage goes up, it causes more voltage regulated gates to open and more sodium diffuses in. So sodium diffuses in, voltage goes up, that causes gates to open, more sodium diffuses in, voltage goes up, that causes more gates to open, more sodium diffuses in. And it keeps going until we hit plus 30 millivolts. So from minus 50 to plus 30 millivolts, this is all about sodium diffusing in, and this is a positive feedback. Now notice one other thing. In this area, we have lots of positive charges inside. What we used to have was more positive charges outside. But now we have so many positive charges inside here that there's actually a reverse in our polarity. In this region only, we actually get a reverse to the polarity. When all that sodium diffuses in, we have all this potassium accumulating just in this one small area, now we're actually more positive inside in comparison to outside. The polarity has reversed. Anytime the polarity reverses this one time, we call this depolarization. So also from minus 50 to plus 30, this is depolarization. This is a reverse or a flipping of our polarity. Say that. Instead, what I want you to say is that at minus 70 millivolts, 
some of these potassium voltage regulated gates start to close. The ones that open, remember, all the sodium voltage regulated gates are already closed. But these potassium voltage regulated gates in this area, some of them begin to slowly close. So at minus 70 millivolts, some of the potassium voltage regulated gates slowly <coughs> close. Not all of them, just some of them. Which also means that some of them are still open. And more potassium can continue to diffuse out. So that we actually see the voltage drop all the way to minus 90 millivolts before all of the potassium voltage regulated gates are closed. At minus 90, mil mil can't talk. minus 90 millivolts, all potassium voltage regulated gates are closed. So all our sodium voltage regulated gates and all our potassium voltage regulated gates are now closed. So that the only thing that's actually working in this area is the sodium potassium ATPase pump. Remember I told you it's always on, it's always working. When sodium and potassium were diffusing in here, it was totally overwhelmed. Couldn't keep up. But now that all the gates are closed, what it's going to do is actively transport free sodium out to potassium back in. So that eventually in this little area here, we will come back to resting membrane potential. And so you'll see, from minus 90 millivolts, we'll get back to resting membrane potential. That's due to the sodium-potassium ATPase pump re-establishing resting membrane potential. So we get a lot more potassium on the outside, and we've reversed the polarity again. Don't forget, if you're saying the words repolarization and depolarization in your essay, you have to tell me what they mean. So we've just flipped the polarity for a second time, and we have repolarization.
So we just went through our first of potentially hundreds of action potentials that need to go down this axon. Now it took us a lot longer, but in the neuron, from the beginning to the end of an action potential, it takes exactly one millisecond. Pretty fast. Now, action potentials can also be referred to as all or none. And that's because once you hit minus 50 millivolts, it's like a domino effect. You start the first action potential, and you're going to have boom, a whole bunch of action potentials all the way down that neuron. Okay? 